governments will want to associate themselves with. These implications of this for uh, um, for other countries, for a kind of pan-Arab rebellion, of course, Tunisia, then Egypt, what do you see happening in Israel, Palestine, and oh, Jordan? Oh, yeah. Clearly, we have maintained, first the British and the French, and then after the Second World War, the Americans, we have maintained a system of patronage for ruthless anti-democratic dictators across the region. We've called them kings, we've called them emirs, we've called them princes, we've called them generals, we've called them um, uh, all kinds of presidents. And um, uh, In Bahrain, for example, you've got uh, His Supreme Majesty the King, who rules over an island about half the size of, um, of, of uh, I suppose, Detroit, if that. Um, but because of this, um, you know, inevitably when you have one country suddenly breaking through to freedom, um, through watching Al Jazeera, for example, the other people in the region in Syria, Jordan, uh, Yemen, uh, Morocco, Mauritania, um, uh, then begin, Algeria especially, then begin to say, well, you know, uh, we demand the same rights. We have a right to live. We have a right to oxygen. Um, but, you know, I, I think that in some ways the, the uprising here is more in common with the revolt of Iranians against the results of the Iranian elections in 2009, which, remember, the opposition was crushed after, than it does with sort of the Iranian revolution or something on a bigger scale. And I'm not entirely certain. Um, you know, these may be tribes with flags, as a crusader historian or historian of the Crusades once described the Arab world, but these are not all the same people. Um, for example, the opposition to King Abdullah in Jordan actually really comes from, the, from elements of the army who feel the Palestinians have become too strong in Jordan. Um, the opposition in Syria would be Sunnis who object to the Alawite minority leadership of the country, where it becomes a more sectarian issue rather than um, an issue of democracy, which is the case in Egypt, because um, with the exception of the 10% cops, virtually everybody here is a Sunni Muslim, including, of course, uh, our dear President Mubarak. Um, or their dear President Mubarak. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I'm a bit suspicious of the idea that uh, just because the Tunisians have a revolution and it spreads to Egypt, therefore, you know, true, there are um, food demonstrations, a high price demonstrations, a protest against the economy in Jordan, and certainly protests against um, um, Saleh, the president of um, Yemen. Um, but I'm not sure it's all the same. And remember that Tunisia, the famous Jasmine Revolution. This, I gather, is going to be called the Papyrus Revolution, heaven help us, in Egypt. Um, in, in Tunisia, the revolution has actually only replaced so far Ben Ali with his, his mates. I mean, Ganoushi is a friend of Ben Ali. He was one of his schoolmates, I believe. And, and here, you've got to remember that um, Omar Suleiman, the new saviour of Egypt, with whom all these people are supposed to negotiate, he is a very close, personal, lifelong friend of Mubarak, and he was a general. Um, so, uh, while at the same time, on the surface, you've got this sort of democratic uprising, and suddenly we're going to have all these new countries, and they're all going to be lovely and believe in our secular values. Um, at the end of the day, the fear is not the Muslim Brotherhood Islamism, it's the fear that um, more generals will be appointed to work for, for the West, and that is basically what is happening. Um, and, and, you know, if, if uh, say, if King Abdullah were in some way persuaded to leave his country, the Jordanian army would be persuaded to find another member of the royal family to take over the job, but perhaps more constitutionally. So the idea that there's going to be this massive sort of overthrow of uh, dictators, yes, there might be, but there'll be more dictators ready to take the role, but in playing a sort of softer role and then gently introducing more emergency laws and restrictions on crowds gathering and so on and so forth, and you're back to square one. Corruption has become such, so much a part of the economy, the oil that makes the economy work, and corruption, of course, is the way in which dictators control their people, that the whole system, the whole functioning of society in the Middle East has been almost irreparably damaged over the decades by the way in which we in the West have encouraged it to function and, and which the dictators are very happy to function, either on our behalf and, of course, financially on their own. What do you think President Obama should do? Um, well, it's always the same case when you or anyone else asked me about U.S. policy. The question is what he should have done. Um, you know, I never really believed quite in Obama. Um, I was very struck by his reference in the um, Cairo speech, the famous, you know, reach out my hand to the Muslim speech, when he referred to the relocation of the Palestinians in 1948, as if the Palestinians suddenly got up and said, oh, let's all go skiing in Lebanon today and never quite go home again, uh, rather than being driven and, from their homes or 
fleeing in terror from the new Israeli army of the time. Um, and I think that, um, you know, because of his weakness, these are the Republicans and, of course, the recent midterm elections, and because of his vanity, I mean, Obama should never have taken the Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize of public speaking, maybe, but, I mean, he should have said, look, I'm not worthy of it, but thank you. Um, he's missed so many steps he could have taken to show that the moral values which he claimed to espouse in that famous Cairo speech, which I attended at Cairo University a few, uh, just about a mile from where I'm talking to now, and only two miles from Tahrir Square, actually. Um, you know, if only he had stuck to those moral values in the Arab world, um, whole America's, you know, the warmth of the Arab world towards America, which was there in the 50s and 60s, even after the establishment of Israel, and was certainly there in the 20s and 30s, might have been reestablished. It was a critical moment. And because of Israel's wishes, you know, the Israelis have made it fairly clear they don't think, you know, these Arabs really should have these elections. <laughs> keep Mubarak, you know, or keep some <laughs> version of Mubarak. Um, and because of his domestic critics, you know, are you going to lose Egypt now, Mr. President? <laughs> I know that's already coming up in editorials. Um, he, he, he did what he always did. He blinked. He was weak. He was vain. He chose not, he chose not to support the good guys. People say, oh, well, you know, someone said to me on a radio show in Ireland yesterday, oh, come on, Robert, you're always saying America should keep its nose out of other countries. Now you want it to interfere. But the fact is it does interfere. It's, it's paying $1.3 billion to the regime every year. Therefore, it is time for it to take the right side in Egypt, and it failed to do so. And that failure will cost America yet again. Uh, it's a tragedy in many ways. You know, here was an opportunity suddenly to get it right, and he flunked it. And he's seen as being a very weak man in the Arab world. You know, Bush was seen as, in a sense, people preferred Bush because they saw him as an intemperate bully, which is pretty much what he was out here. Whereas Obama came forward with, you know, as a man who seemed to have something to offer of moral value. And at the end of the day, the moral values have gone out of the window. And we're back with, oh, the Egyptian people must decide, but it must be an orderly transition. Well, orderly means another six or seven months of Mubarak. And, of course, the nightmare here is that if... The demonstrators go home, whether they get arrested or not and beaten and tortured afterwards is not the point. Then there'll be more stability, tourists will come back, the army will be happy, and then Mubarak will suddenly discover that for the good of Egypt, he'd like another six-year term starting in September this year. That, that, I think, is probably the nightmare scenario and not one that's entirely, um, you know, without credibility. Robert Fiss speaking to us from Cairo, the longtime Middle East correspondent for the independent newspaper of London, author of a number of books, including The Great War for Civilization, The Conquest of the